Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number 9 and I'm going to discuss the magnetic torque on a current loop. The titles of the previous videos to this are written on the bottom left of your screen. The most important of these videos is number 8 where I discuss the multipole expansion for the magnetic vector potential. I also discuss the magnetic dipole moment here and that will be very important. So the reason the magnetic torque on a current loop is important is because it is what plays a central role in generators and motors. Now we also require electromagnetic induction and that is a topic which I am not going to discuss in my tutorials in magnetostatics. I will discuss that um, in Maxwell's equations. But essentially the magnetic torque on a current loop is what allows us to generate electricity. So if you understand this, you understand one of the most important principles for any electric generator. So let's, let's begin. On the left hand side of your screen I have a reasonably involved looking diagram. And the reason I've drawn it in this way is I feel that it's probably the best way to do it. And in the next page we'll see that I actually have a simplified version. So what I'm going to try and do is go through each of the components separately and hopefully you will understand the whole thing. So just before we begin discussing each of the components or the elements of this particular diagram, I'd like you to remember that a loop or a current loop is literally just a series of line segments. So you can break down any current loop as a the, the summation of a series of line segments. Now what we will see in this particular video is that in this particular setup the sum of the magnetic forces on a current on this particular current loop will be zero but the torque will be non-zero. Now remember of course that the magnetic moment is perpendicular to the area of a current loop. So let's begin. So on the left hand side the first thing to note is that we have a magnetic field which is going in the vertical direction. So this corresponds with the z dimension. So it's in the z dimension. The next thing I'd like to point out are the dimensions themselves. So you have the z axis, the x axis and the y axis. We have our Cartesian coordinate system. So if you just look at the, the, the blue lines you can uh, take those out of the diagram and you'll be able to see them yourself. The next thing to look at is the series of orange line segments and these represent a current loop or a rectangular current loop. So notice that it is at an angle to the coordinate system so it's, it's, it's tilted and Although I haven't got into the detail, you can imagine that in the center of this line segment here, at the that bra or excuse me, at that black circle, and this one over here, we have some sort of a clamp, and this allows us to rotate or turn the uh, the the current loop or the line segments themselves. The next thing we're going to look at is the current flowing through the wire or through the series of line segments, and that is illustrated here, here, uh, here, and is there, any, there are only three of them that I've shown. Notice that it's going in an anti-clockwise direction. Now we're not going to discuss how the current came about that for the moment, or for our purposes at the moment, is not actually very important. But it is important to note that we have a current in our current loop and that it is going in an anti-clockwise direction. The next thing we need to note is how we're going to calculate the magnetic force. So if you look at the bottom left of your screen I've written the equation for the magnetic force. It's the current outside of the integral of dl cross b. So dl is the infinitesimal line segment on your uh, on your total line segment which in this case is our current loop and b is the applied magnetic field. So how do we go about calculating the different forces on each of the line segments? We do that by applying the left or right hand rules. Personally, I like to use my left hand in order to compute the cross product. So let's first of all look at the line segment on the top, which is from here to here. Let's look at that line segment first. So we first of all need to define the infinitesimal line, uh, the infinitesimal line segment. So the current is going in an anti-clockwise direction, and for that reason, so will the infinitesimal line segment. So in order to compute the cross product, I point my index finger of my left hand in the direction of the infinitesimal line segment. 
so that it will be pretty much pointing to the left. I then extend my thumb perpendicular to my index finger and I rotate my hand so that my thumb is now pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. So in this case, the index finger of my left hand will be pointing to the left and the thumb will be pointing upwards. I'll then extend my middle finger perpendicular to my palm and that will be the direction of the applied force. So we can see that in this case the direction of the applied force on this particular line segment is given by F sub 1 and it's going pretty much in the direction of uh, to the right. So on this particular line segment on the top we have a force due to the magnetic field going to the right. Now it's easiest I think to analyze this using pairs so let's look at the opposite line segment here and through the same logic we can see that this time the magnetic force is going to be going to the left. So the current has swapped direction and as a result the magnetic force has swapped direction. So F sub 1 and F sub 2 point in the opposite directions. Now let's look at the other two line segments. The first one I'm going to look at is from here to to here. Okay, so that is the third of our four line segments. Once again, we compute the cross product. In this case, I'm going to use my left hand. And it's very straightforward to see that in this case, F sub 3, or the force on this particular line segment, is pointing to the left, as illustrated by F sub 3 here. And using the same logic, if we look at the opposite line segment over here, we find that the magnetic force on this particular line segment is going in the opposite direction, namely to the right. So just to confirm, what we've found so far is that F sub 1 and F sub 2 point in the opposite directions, and F sub 3 and F sub 4 point in the opposite directions. Now, what you should look at is the lines at, on which these forces act. So we can see that F sub 3 and F sub 4 seem to be on the same line. What this means is that they cannot create a torque. However, if we look at F sub 1 and F sub 2, they are not on the same line, and although we'll see in a moment that their forces are equal, and therefore the net force is zero, they can create and will create a torque. So to recap, what we've seen is that the sum of the forces on our current loop are zero. And this is because each of the forces has another force of equal magnitude, but in, in the opposite direction. But because of forces F sub 1 and F sub 2, the net torque is going to be non-zero. So there is going to be a torque on our current loop. Now we need to discuss the magnetic moment. So the magnetic moment is given by using the right hand rule, where you curl your your right hand in the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the current and you extend your thumb perpendicular to your hand in a point in the direction of the magnetic moment. In this case it is perpendicular to the plane of the current loop and it's given given here. Alright, so this the reason it's uh, the reason it's perpendicular to it is because we know that mu is equal to i times a, but that it is the vector area, so we have a direction, which in this case is perpendicular to our current length or excuse me, our current, uh, current area. Now the next thing we need to note are the lengths of our sides. So I'm going to define the lengths of the sides perpendicular to the magnetic field as having A meters in length and the other two sides having B meters in length. And I'm going to illustrate that in a moment on another, on another diagram. So don't worry about it for the moment. The next thing I'd like to point out are the angles. And the reason the angles are important is for us to calculate or to allow us to calculate the magnetic forces. So if I connect the origin here with the center of the line segment here, that will give me the angle phi, or that is the angle which I'm going to define as phi. And of course, we're going to get the angle 90 minus phi also. So let's go, go about and calculate the four forces, namely F sub 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we're going to use the equation written on the bottom left of your screen. So it's it, let, let's for the moment leave out the integral. So it's going to be the current, let's say if we're looking at the first line segment, it's going to be the current multiplied by dl cross b. So the cross product is simply going to be the two magnitudes multiplied, and then we also have the sine of the angle between the two. 
And of course, I can go from the integral of the infinitesimal line segment to the actual length of it by uh, by by just by doing that. I suppose the integral of dl in this particular line segment is going to give us the length, which is a. So we're going to have i times a times b multiplied by the angle between them, which in this case is going to be uh, phi or sine phi. Using the exact same logic, we can evaluate the force F sub 2, which is over here. And we can evaluate F sub 2 as having the same magnitude but the opposite direction. So it's for this reason that we give it a minus sign. I'm sure that's pretty straightforward and pretty clear. It might take you a moment to visualize the actual angles that we have, but I'm sure that you'll be able to convince yourself that what I've written is in fact correct. So we've now evaluated F sub 1 and F sub 2. Now if you look closely, if we look, let's say, at f sub 3, so the integral of dl is simply going to be its length, which is small b. So you have the current i times the length small b times the magnitude of the field capital B, multiplied by the sine of the angle in between. In this case, the sine of the angle in between is going to be 90 minus phi. So once again, it might take you a moment to look at this and visualize that, in fact, this is the angle between them. And if you apply your... your uh, your identities or your trigonometric identities, you'll very quickly realize that the sine of 90 minus phi is in actual fact equal to cosine of phi. So that means we've calculated f sub 3. And using the same logic that we have the same magnitude but opposite direction for f sub 4, we're able to calculate f sub 4. So it's going to be minus i times small b times capital B times the cosine of the angle between, which is phi. So let's recap upon this by using our second diagram. So once again, f sub 3 and f sub 4 act on the same line. So we're talking about this particular force and this particular force. So they act on the same line, and as a result, the net force is zero, but also the net torque is going to be zero. So there's nothing out of the ordinary with which we must analyze here. So this is in contrast with the other two forces, namely F sub 1 and F sub 2. We know that torque is, the, the vector torque is R cross F, and that is the formula for the vector torque, R cross F. So let's see if we can calculate the torque on the current loop due to the forces F sub 1 and F sub 2. So we need to look at the the value for R, which is a distance distance to the fulcrum. So if you look at the bottom left of your screen, it's pretty straightforward to realize that in actual fact, R corresponds with the length B over two. All right, so that means that we're able to work out the magnitude of the torque as being small B over two times the current I times small A, which is the length of the line segment, times the magnitude of the magnetic field applied, which is capital B, times the sine of the angle between, which is phi. So putting it all together, we take the sum of the, the total torque and we get, of course, 2 times this, which cancels the factor of 2 in the bottom. And we find out that the total torque is, in actual fact, the current times the area, which is small a times small b, uh, times the magnitude of the magnetic field, capital B, times the sine of the angle between, which is phi. But we know, of course, that the magnetic uh, dipole moment is mu and that's going to be equal to the current times the vector area A. We've already given the direction which is perpendicular to the current loop. So for that reason, we can just talk about a scalar for the moment. And we can write the torque in terms of the magnetic dipole moment. So we get tau is equal to mu times B times sine phi. But once again, if we look closely, this is essentially the definition of a cross product. And we find that the magnetic torque on our current loop is in actual fact equal to the cross product between the magnetic dipole moment and the applied magnetic field. So I would imagine that if you look and uh, at, the, at the diagrams, after a while you'll be able to visualize what's going on and I'm sure you'll be able to agree that in actual fact what we're looking at is the torque being equal to mu cross B. Now I have two things which I'd like to say before we finish. The first one is the following. Any current loop can be approximated by a series of uh, rectangles or a series of line segments. So let's say in this case we're looking at the large line current loop uh, in blue which has twists and turns and whatnot. We can 
approximate the total current or the, the cur this particular current loop as the sum of a series of smaller current loops which are in this case going to be rectangular. And we'll see the reason we can do this is because for each current loop, let's say we have current going this way in, on one loop and I know I've drawn them s being separate, but there's the next current loop, the current will be going this way. And we'll find that the current in the middle will always cancel out and we will always be getting the only the external components. And we add up all the external components, we get in actual fact the correct result. So we can always approximate any or an arbitrary current loop as a sum of a series of current rectangular loops. Now the last thing I would like to do is just hint at how an electric motor and electric generator works. So let's imagine we have a magnetic field which is created by two particular bar magnets, one with a north, sole and a north pole and a south pole like this, and we put in it a current loop. What will happen is the current loop will have a magnetic torque, let's say there's a, there's a force in this line segment going upwards, there'll be a force in this line segment going downwards, and there will be no torque in this line segment, and there will be no torque on this one and this one. So there will only be a torque on two of the line segments, namely here and here. And this will cause the current loop to turn, and it will turn until it is, well, let's say, 90 degrees which would look something like that. And you can just take it from me that when it does this, the cross product dies and in actual fact we get no more torque. But the thing is still moving so it'll actually flip over from 90 degrees and come down the other side and once again experience a torque. And the reason this is important is that the applied magnetic field will cause a current to be induced in the wire and is the current which is induced in the wire which we call or use as our electricity. Now that of, of course involves the theory of electromagnetic induction which I'm not going to do now but I'm just giving you a hint that it is through the torque uh, uh, due to the magnetic field on our current loop which allows us to get current in our wire and we use this current in our wire as electricity essentially. So that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends subscribe to my channel and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.